Welcome, and thank you for participating in the on-site sewage facilities webinar today. My name is Rachel Evans, and I'm with the North Central Texas Council of Governments, and I'll be monitoring, moder moderating today's webinar. A few housekeeping items. Um, we will have four presentations today with time for questions at the end. Please feel free to submit any questions in the chat box at the bottom during the webinar. We're also going to be recording today's webinar, and it will be made available on our website along with the presentation. The website can be found at the bottom of the slides. Uh, additionally, please make sure to mute your phones, otherwise we can hear the background noise. Um, so to kick off today's webinar, I'm going to provide you with an overview of water quality challenges facing North Central Texas and highlight some of the initiatives that COG has underway to address them. Then I'm going to throw it over to our presenters who will discuss different strategies for managing on-site sewage facilities and some funding opportunities for rural communities related to sanitary sewer infrastructure. But first, a brief overview of who we are. Uh, the North Central Texas Council of Governments, or the COG, is a voluntary association of local governments. We're one of 24 COGs in Texas, and our main function is to transcend jurisdictional boundaries to promote sound development and facilitate cooperation among our member governments. Why is COG interested in water quality? Um, well, the short answer is because our member governments recognize the importance of implementing water quality initiatives in order to maintain a high quality of life for residents in North Central Texas. Water quality impacts the health and safety and welfare of residents and also the ecosystem and long-term economic growth. Uh, some water quality challenges in North Central Texas um, and the Upper Trinity River Basin um, are associated with bacteria impairments. Impairments is a term used by the state of Texas to define water bodies that are not meeting their state mandated water quality standards for their recreational use. Some sources of bacteria are listed here including bird and wild animal waste, pet waste, stormwater runoff, sanitary sewer overflows, agricultural practices, wastewater treatment plants, illicit discharges, and on-site sewage facilities, the topic of today's webinar. And while this list is not exhaustive, it does highlight some important point and non-point sources that are impacting water bodies in our backyard. To address the bacteria impairments in the Upper Trinity River, local stakeholders engage in a voluntary process to implement best management practices that work to reduce the amount of bacteria going into lower water bodies through our total maximum daily load and implementation plan program. A TMDL is calculated is a calculated value of the amount of a pollutant, in this case um, bacteria within the Upper Trinity River, that can enter into a waterway and still allow the waterway to meet its water quality standards for its primary use. Our implementation plan began in 2013 and covers implementation efforts of 21 TMDLs in the Upper Trinity River. The I plan has strategies uh, aimed specifically at on-site sewage facilities, including property inspection guideline development, funding for available repair and replacement, extending sanitary sewer service, and education and outreach about the consequences of improper on-site sewage facility maintenance to homeowners, inspectors, real estate agents, and local governments. Another initiative underway in the Upper Trinity River Basin is the Vision 303D approach to water quality protection. The Vision 303D approach is a strategy developed by EPA that gives credit for um, implementing alter alternative efforts uh, beyond a TMDL to reduce bacteria going into the waterways. This stakeholder-led effort was initiated in 2015 in the Upper Trinity River Basin to assist TCEQ with implementing the 303D vision approach in a priority area. The vision aims to cover almost 30 bacteria-impaired water bodies by 2020. Um, NCT COG also works in water quality management planning, and we contract with TCEQ to engage in this program within the region. We're the designated agency for the development of an annual water quality management plan which provides an overview of efforts underway and future planning needs related to population growth, water quality, and wastewater management, including wastewater capacity needs. COG also offers technical and outreach support to watershed protection initiatives throughout the region, and we perform conformance review of wastewater infrastructure projects to ensure they adhere 
to the goals of the Water Quality Management Plan. Um, the map in the upper right-hand corner shows the water quality impairments um, for, that were established by the 2014 Texas 303D list, the purple being our bacteria-impaired waterways. And the bottom right show our wastewater treatment plants by capacity. Uh, here's my contact information. If you have any questions, please feel free to call our email or write any questions in the comment box about the programs underway within our Council of Government. Next, we will be hearing from Will Morrell with Houston Galveston Area Council, who will provide an overview of their on site sewage facility management program. Great. Hello. Um, my name is Will Merrill. I'm an environmental planner with the Houston Galveston Area Council. Um, and I'm here to talk about our OSSF initiatives here at HGAC. Will, you may need to click back into the, your screen. Okay. There you go. There we go. All right, so um, the map on the right-hand side shows the HJC area. We cover 13 counties, Walker County to the north, Colorado, Wharton County, Matagorda to the, east, to the west, and Liberty Chambers to the east. It's a, a very large area geographically, and we are the only COG um, in, in Texas that is part of the Clean Rivers Program. So we're a lead partner agency and we manage the ambient water quality monitoring within one river basin, the San Jacinto Basin, three coastal basins, and the basin estuaries that drain into Galveston Bay. So why are we interested in on-site sewage facilities? And just, I'm sure everyone is aware, but an OSSF is any um, system that collects, stores, separates, treats, and then disperses water, wastewater on the same site in which um, that wastewater originated. Um, there are many different types. There's conventional septic systems, there are aerobic systems that are pretty much many wastewater treatment plants. But the key is on site. And if it leaves the site and drains into a waterway or doesn't get treated in the upper layers of the soil and drains into the groundwater, it's not performing as it's supposed to, and therefore it's contaminating the waters of Texas. And um, this map illustrates just all the bacteria impaired streams we have in the region. It's the number one um, pollution constituent here. Um, I'm sure it's also the number one in most areas of Texas, but over 50% of assessed water bodies are either impaired or have a concern for bacteria. And so um, we have Many different um, plans, whether they be watershed protection plans or TMDLs um, throughout the area. And uh, the plans that are kind of that goldenrod color, and also the center one, the Bacteria Implementation Group TMDL, those are all HGAC run watershed plans. The ones in purple are um, partner agencies throughout the region. They're the project managers for those. But each one of these projects, it's to combat and reduce bacteria in our waterways. And OSSFs are a, a source of, of bacteria. Now, in our region, we do have over 400 wastewater treatment plants. You know, there's wildlife, there's failing sewage infrastructure. There's a lot of, you know, key contributors to bacteria. But OSSFs have always been identified as a key contributor, but we wanted to know to what extent and to which waterways OSSFs were the main contributor. So we did some research um, using census records, and um, we estimated that there are probably 2 million OSSFs in the state. And in the HJC region, there are over 300,000, which is pretty much 15% of all systems throughout the state of Texas. And this is a report from 2001. Um, it was from the Texas On-Site Wastewater Treatment Research Council, one of my favorite acronyms, tow truck. But uh, they actually don't exist anymore, but that's a different story. But from this paper, in order for a designated representative, this is the person who permits OSSFs, 
in a jurisdiction. To fulfill the responsibilities of the, of the job, it is important to have a complete understanding of the number and location of the OSSF systems within his or her jurisdiction. And in talking to the different um, designated representatives at the counties and also some cities within our region do permit systems, we found that they didn't exactly know the number and they sure as didn't know the location of each system. And so, well, in 2010, I joined HGAC as an intern. And my first project, because I have a background in GIS, was to map every OSSF within the 13 county region. And the only way that we could figure out how to do this is to map them using addresses. So we had, um, you know, some some issues and challenges, you know, taking over this very large project. Um, permit records, there was no common source or format of the data, meaning there were printed records. Some people were using computer programs such as SAFE. That's a pretty common one. Some folks in jurisdictions were just using an Excel file. Um, but but yeah, there we had many different data types that we were trying to put into a common database. Um, levels of precision. Some entities had very precise records that dated back until, um, you know, permitting began, but others did not. And um, others just didn't really, you know, record complete addresses and, and things like that. And we ran into a lot of that. And like I said, lack of electronic records, a lot of entities still had uh, paper records that had to be digitized. So unpermitted grandfather systems. Now, the state didn't require permitting OSSFs until 1989. So everything that was in, that was installed prior to is considered grandfathered, meaning it's before the permitting process. Now, they will get a permit if they fail, if the system fails, usually the the DR will, once the repair is made or it's replaced, it will get a permit. But anything, you know, installed prior to, we really didn't know the location of because there's not a record associated with it. The condition, they're very old and intended use, meaning, you know, there might be a 250 gallon tank installed at a two bedroom home that, you know, two and a half people were living in, but now that home has six people living in it and the tank just can't, it can't meet up to that capacity. Also soil type before formal permitting began, um, soil type wasn't usually taken into consideration. They do perk tests, but that's a little bit different. Occupancy, like I said, climate, you know, if it's wetter or drier, depending on when it was installed. So there are many factors that could cause, um, you know, these grandfathered systems to fail. So collecting the data from the DRs, this was the most challenging part of the project, you know, playing phone tag, going out to our different counties and cities, collecting this data. It took a few months, but I was able to get it. And so I had to, I had all these data sources that I had to put into one common database. And so all together, we collected almost 110,000 records. Now, this is what I mean by, you know, not a very precise location, but we, I came across one that the, instead of an address, it just said three houses down from Rosie. Well, I don't know who Rosie is. I don't know what three houses is down from her. So records such as these, we weren't able to actual locate via the address. And this is everything all said and done. Um, we did have 31% of the records we received. We just couldn't do anything with them. Insufficient, meaning it was something like three houses, houses down from Rosie, unable to geocode. Um, there, something was wrong with the address. We couldn't match it. It just, and we, we keep those in a separate file and we do run them on occasion, hoping we'll get some hits. Uh, we had 4% were al already shape files that had latitude and longitude coordinates. So we could plug those right in into our database. Um, street address points. Now, these are points that we identified to the street network. So it's not actually on the property itself. It's on basically the mailbox in front of the house. And parcel ID centroids. We do have um, parcel or property boundary data sets for eight of our 13 counties. And we were able to identify the address to the property 
And so we didn't know where on the property the OSS was located, so we just put it right in the center. So the, that's the different um, hits, I guess you could say, we got with um, this mapping project. So this is all said and done. These are all of the OSSFs within our 13 county region. Like I said, we had almost 110,000 records collected. We were able to match about three quarters of those, and we did have quite a few records remaining. Now, in order to prevent data loss in the future through um, our bacteria implementation group, we were able to procure GPS units for our designated representatives within the region. So each county and some cities do have GPS units. That, so when they go out and permit assist a, a system, they can take a latitude and longitude coordinate. And we still ask them to submit records for us. We're, keep, we're growing this database um, through the years and um, most submit on a monthly basis. And so we're getting really precise um, locations now of, of our on-site systems instead of having to use something like, you know, address mapping. So, like I mentioned, we had over 30,000 records that we weren't able to identify, plus I received 110,000 and as I said at the beginning of this presentation, we had about 300,000 records within the 13 counties. So we ran a GIS analysis to try to identify these grandfathered illegal, the common term is bootleg systems, and those systems we might have missed. And so I'm gonna, the next slide is kind of a zoomed in picture, but this is Harris County. All of the properties that are kind of this goldenrod color, there are properties that are within uh, sanitary sewer service boundary. So we know they're getting sanitary sewer. The red properties are outside of that, uh, outside of service area boundaries. And these teal colored properties, those are ones that we know have no SSF because they're in our database. So this gives us an idea of areas that must have some sort of um, sewerage, whether it's an on-site system, an outhouse, or something because they are either commercial, industrial, or residential properties that have to have some sort of sewage treatment. So we were able to kind of build this kind of analysis. I'm not gonna say it's incredibly precise. Um, some of our service area boundary coverages could probably be a bit better. Also, there are OSSFs within service area boundaries. Um, and we know this from the database, like there's one right in the middle of downtown Houston. But if two, you know, sewer lines for whatever reason can't meet and there's a structure there, it has to have treatment somehow. So it'll have an on-site sewage facility. And we, did, we wanted to get this data out, um, you know, knowing that not just the everyday person would want to view it and look at it, but especially for our member governments under more rural counties that can't really afford um, using GIS or have the expertise. So we built a, what we call our OSSF information system. It's an online application and it gives the user tools like you can select by permit, you can um, you know zoom in and grab and select what you're interested in. We also put in a, a widget that allowed turn by turn directions. So if um, a guy with, let's say, Austin County was going out and needed to inspect five systems that day. He could use this app to kind of get his driving route in order to do it. I will say I do have the URL at the bottom, but we are currently updating it. When we made this app, it was made with Adobe Flash, which um, I'm sure some of you know that Apple does not support anymore, and Google Chrome is not supporting it. So we are updating the application to JavaScripting, and it's going to take a little bit of time. But um, check back. If, if you go to this URL and it won't work, I promise we're going to have something up and running in the next few months. So we do have a couple um, OSSF initiatives that are not GIS-based or database. And this is our main kind of outreach project. We or I actually developed a Texas Real Estate Commission um, continuing education course for home inspectors, 
about how to properly inspect your on-site sewage facility. And why did we decide to do this? Well, we identified a point of sale inspection, something when the property changes hands, it would be the perfect time in trying to identify a failing system. So when the property is sold, it hopefully will get fixed um, during that transfer process. Uh, OSSF systems are optional in the Texas Real Estate Commission Home Inspection Guidelines. Um, they're up there with with swimming pools and other um, you know optional systems. So not every um, home inspector is looking at them. In some mortgage products, uh, many do require the OSSF to be inspected, but many don't. And we we knew just from anecdotal evidence that a lot of them were were not being inspected when a property was sold. And also, it allows for new homeowner education. If the home inspector, you know, knows something about an on-site system and can do a rudimentary visual inspection, but also just um, talk to the potential homeowner about the on-site system, hopefully some knowledge can be spread. Um, I know I learned a lot when my wife and I bought our house um, from our home inspector, and so, um, we identified this as kind of a great educational opportunity. Plus, just looking at trends within our region, there are a lot of people moving from urban suburban areas out to rural areas, you know, for retirement or or just for a lower cost of living. So they're going from, you know, predominantly sanitary sewer to on-site systems, and they probably don't have that that education base to you know, do that transition flawlessly. So this at least allowed for for some education. I'm not going to read everything on this slide, but this is kind of our introduction. What we cover, um, safety is important. Um, we talk about system fail failures, um, how to find the OSSF on the property. And these are the three systems we focus on, the conventional system. And we also do have the the Septage is transferred or final for final treatment. So conventional system, we look at, we discuss the drink yield for LPD systems, that's distribution pipes, and for the aerobic treatment unit, we talk about tertiary treatment with chlorine and also the spray heads or spray distribution. And finally, this is um, kind of our last project. We have what's called a supplementary environmental project fund. And if if you're not aware that Texas Water Code allows for, um, so let's say there's an entity out there that, like a business that for whatever reason, maybe they did it unintentionally, accidentally, but they might have released something that they shouldn't have into a waterway. Well, TCEQ, you know, through the enforcement process will find them and they can either, you know, put that fine back into the Texas General Fund or it can go to something like something, an SEP, a Supplementary Environmental Project Fund. So it can go to do something beneficial to the environment. And many entities have these SEP funds. 10% um, of the SEP of the fund can go to covering administrative costs. And so we applied and we were approved for a SEP just for fixing OSSFs within our region. Um, the cap we have is a little less than half a million dollars. It's strictly for replacements or repairs. Our goal was, you know, in the first five years to fix or replace 50 to 100 systems. We don't quite have that. In fact, we've only received a few thousand dollars, but we're putting it to good use. But it keeps the money in the community, meaning if something happens in Brazoria County, since we are, our SEP covers the whole 13 county region, we can fix. OSSFs in Brazoria County. That was our goal, to fix problems where the original problem originated from. And we've had some success. We've had it for a few years now. Um, really, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there are many SEPs out there, so you're kind of competing with other entities such, such as Texas Parks and Wildlife. But, you know, we're, we're trying to get this off the ground and advertising it. We've had some success so far. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, I'm I'm going to 
be participating in this uh, webinar. So if you have any questions at the end, please let me know. And thank you for letting me be a part of this today. Thank you, Will. Uh, next up, we'll be hearing from Anish Santrania with Texas A&M AgriLife Research and Extension Service about whether or not septic systems are a nuisance or an asset. Anish, I'm going to send it over to you. All right. Uh, let's see. So I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I guess it was a very good presentation by Will. He probably said most of the thing uh, that I wanted to say, so we'll we'll go through it fast. Uh, I'm with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, and I started working in this program uh, just about two and a half years ago, 2014. So what we do here, let's see, is this thing going to move? There we go. Real quick, uh, I'm sure everybody knows about OSSF, but we'll just quickly go over the basic definition. We'll talk about what types of system we see in Texas, so we'll just a little bit on the permitting uh, in your particular area. Then we'll dwell into this, either it's a nuisance or asset, and what we're trying to do at TAMU to make sure it's not you know, a nuisance, but it becomes an asset for the property owner. So as uh, Will said, these systems are basically wastewater treatment systems, and they also treat and dispose wastewater for homes and businesses where there are no sewer connections, or so people either can't connect to sewer because there is none exist, or they don't want to connect. In an academic sense, uh, there is a source of wastewater right there uh, that comes to some type of pretreatment unit that treats the wastewater a little bit, not completely, but then finally we rely on what we call soil environment for that final treatment. Uh, in Texas, uh, what we see typically, this pretreatment unit is a septic tank, or what we call ATU, aerobic treatment unit. And for disposal, we either have a conventional drain field or some kind of alternative drain field, or now we start seeing a lot of uh, above-grade land-based spray system. And this system sort of look pretty when they are done right. So here's some example. Here's a conventional drain fill system uh, in a typical rural setting where there's plenty of land. But people also build homes along the coastline. So this is a coastal home where you see tank over here, down below a raised home, and they would have a small spray system. So that's your typical OSSF. In Texas, what is happening is, uh, this is the kind of trend uh, that we are seeing. Um, we're collecting a lot of data at, at Texas A&M, and since 1990, 94, we now have a good analysis. And if you look at what types of disposal system people have ability to, to choose from is a long list. It can be as simple as irrigation, surface irrigation or spray system to as complex as mound. What's interesting that we are seeing in Texas, the, the top bar, the dark green, I don't know whether you can see this or not, those are the spray system. And since about 2000 or 1996 or seven, they're really taking off. So now the trend is more of a spray system with aerobic unit, and they're replacing what we call conventional drain fill system. So that the, bar, the second bar is conventional drain fill. And it, bottom of that is all everything rest. Well, these are good concepts, but they also require a good level of understanding, and when people don't have that understanding, that's when problems start happening, how to maintain the system. So uh, we have a good publication. Um, typically what we hear in Texas is, is people, are, people think that they probably uh, are not allowed to put a conventional drain fill, but that's not a case. So I would encourage you to download this very simple publication. It's a selecting and permitting OSSF. It's all about what type of soil conditions you have at the at, at your property that decide what system you can choose. Uh, but in I've been here for a couple of years, and when we do a program in in the real world, people say, "Hey, is state prohibiting conventional septic system?" And we always say, "No, you still have a right to choose a conventional septic system." It depends on your site conditions. So if you have not seen this document, do go to our website, download it, and, and use it uh, wisely so people understand what choices they have. Uh, in, in the area, North Central Texas, I, I'm just curious to see where, what you have going on. Most of the permitting 
process is done locally, as we all know. So out of your 16 county, if you happen to be in this county, Denton, people have choice. I mean, there are a lot of different DR entities. In this county, there are literally 18 different permitting entities that uh, people will have to go and, and get their permit. On the other hand, you have the other counties, like some small counties, they would have just a couple of uh, entities uh, that would issue permit. What happens is all these entities, they do report to TCEQ uh, at the end of the year or monthly basis about their permitting activity. And we are using their data set to figure out at the state level what, what the count looks like. So when I came to Texas, uh, as I said, in 2014, I first started with, to, with, the, with a census report. In 1990, U.S. Census, that was the last time they did county-by-county county reporting on OSSF, uh, or, or basically the homes, they are not connected to sewer. So I started that as a background information, as a baseline. So back in 1990, according to census, there were about 1.3 million OSSF, and this was sort of like a distribution map over the, uh, in our state. You look at the dark color, those are the counties in your area around here. There were few counties uh, with more than 10,000 systems. Some of the you know, western counties, you see less than 1,000 systems, and in between 1,000 to 10,000. Well, as of 2015, that's the most up-to-date information we have in our data set. Uh, uh, this is what the map looks like. So OSSF, uh, they are growing uh, because people are moving into areas that just don't have sewer. And, and the density of them within a, in each county is changing. So if you look at this area, uh, you see how many more counties now have more than 10,000 systems. And Will was talking about this area, even that's growing right there. So east of I-35, the number of OSSFs are growing tremendously. And even on the western side, we do see uh, counties becoming a little bit darker. So. The good news is uh, for us, at least for people like myself, we are living doing OSSF education, so we got plenty of work to do. And and there are also challenges. So let's see. All right, here we go. A typical OSSF, when done right, as I said, a conventional system would look something like this: a nice conventional drain fill system. The green stripes represents where the drain fill lines are, which is okay. As long as the ground is not soggy in this area, that system is functioning well. But it doesn't take too long before that drain fill could look like this. Now, these are two different sites. But my team, we were out in the uh, 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 coastal area just last week, and we saw several homes with OSSF that look like this. And this is, there are many reasons that I'll tell you a little bit later uh, for good drain fill becoming like this quickly. Uh, there are some complex systems that people have to use because they just don't have good soil or they are too close to water bodies. Here's an example of a project that my team did several years back in coastal zone. Fairly complex system, a lot of tanks. As you can see, this is an aerobic unit with disinfection going into drip system. And this is the same house looking at different angle. But this field right here is all drip tubing. And this is a very well done uh, OSSF well designed, well planned, and it's about three years old. And maybe about five, six years later, we'll go back again to see how it's doing. Uh, the spray, ATU and spray, a typical home with ATU and spray will look like this. This is the aerobic treatment plant somewhere here, and those little white pipes, they are the spray nozzles. And again, what happens is all this OSSF will become a nuisance. Well, one of these three reasons, well, all of them, either they are not designed properly, what we call a misfit, either the system is misfit for the site or for the user, and this is the designer problem, or they are not installed properly. Even if you have a very well-designed system, if it's not installed properly, it will not function. And if you have well-designed and well-installed system when not maintained properly, you're going to start seeing things like this. And these are all the nuisance uh, that we see typically uh, in field. And when an OSSF becomes like this, it is, it is really not, it becomes a nuisance rather than an asset. So what we are doing at TAMU, uh, we, our goal is to educate and train homeowners, licensed professionals, policymakers, 
pretty much everybody who's interested in this field to educate them, to make sure they understand what, uh, what these things are. We also do a lot of research and demonstration. And now we are focusing on inventory and mapping. As, as uh, Will says, we've got to know where these things are. That's number one. If we don't know where these things are, uh, we have a hard time. And if we do it right, we can literally stop all this, what we call failing OSSF or not properly functioning OSSF. Uh, we offer classes. Uh, we can come to your area. Here's Ryan Gerlich. He's uh, doing homeowner class uh, where we you know, we have either two-hour workshop just to give a brief introduction of septic system, or we offer a full-day six-hour class, how to maintain, properly maintain your aerobic treatment system and the spray system. We also offer CEU, Continuing Education Unit Program, for licensed professionals. And we have two classes, one for eight hours and another for 16 hours. All these classes do have a fee, uh, and we can discuss that if you are interested. Another thing we have at the, on our Relish campus in Bryan, Texas, is a hands-on training center. It, it is a, it's a very good, excellent facility where you come, you get to see all these units uh, close up. It's a conventional septic tank, how it works, or an aerobic system, different types of aerobic system, different types of disposal system, and it's a great facility for everyone to get to see and get hands-on experience. Here's my contact information. Uh, right now there are two of us, uh, main uh, team members, uh, myself and Ryan Gerlich. We also have a simple website. We try to keep it up, um, but you find all of our documents on that website. And I'll be here for the remaining of period. Thank you. Thank you, Anish. Uh, next we're going to throw it over to Terry Shinowitz with USDA Rural Development to learn about the water and waste disposal loan and grant program. Uh, Terry? We're sending it to you. About USDA rural development and the programs that we administer. For those of you who may not be familiar with USDA rural development, we are a lending agency and we administer over 40 loan and grant programs nationwide that are designed to help grow and sustain economic development opportunities in rural America. Today I've been asked to share with you some information about our Water and Waste Disposal Loan and Grant Program. Okay, so uh, this program is um, designed to provide funding for clean and reliable drinking water systems, sanitary sewage disposal, sanitary solid waste disposal, and stormwater drainage to rural communities that serve local households and businesses. So we're looking specifically at this program at Community Connected Systems. Uh, the definition of rule varies throughout our programs. In some of the other programs we administer, you may find that the term rule includes cities and towns with populations up to 20,000 and even 50,000 in population. For the Water and Waste Program, however, rule is defined as a rural area and cities and towns up to 10,000 in population, uh, tribal lands in rural areas, and colonias along the border. Who may apply for this program? It's designed to assist qualified applicants that are not otherwise able to obtain commercial credit at reasonable rates and terms. Eligible applicants include most state and local government entities, such as counties, cities, and municipal and special utility districts. Private nonprofit organizations such as water supply corporations, we deal with many of those throughout the state, and federally recognized Indian tribes. What type of funds are available, you ask? Well, we're able to offer a long term low interest loan with a maximum 40 year term at a fixed interest rate. Interest rates are subject to change on a quarterly basis. The current rates range between 2% and 3 and 3 8 percent depending on the median household income of the project and whether the project is necessary to alleviate health and sanitary issues such as uh, TCEQ violations and enforcement issues. If an applicant is eligible and funds are available, grants may be combined with a loan if it's necessary to keep user costs reasonable. Grant assistance is determined by the median household income of the project, whether the applicant can demonstrate the financial need for a grant, 
and if, and if grant funds are available at the time the application is ready to be funded. Funds can be used to finance the acquisition, construction, or improvement of drinking water sourcing, treatment, storage, and distribution, sewage collection, transmission, treatment, and disposal, solid waste collection, disposal, and closure, such as for landfills, stormwater collection, transmission, and disposal. And funds are also available for other project-related activities, such as to cover the legal and engineering fees associated with the project, for land acquisition, water and land rights, permits, and equipment necessary for the construction of the funded project. Um, funds can also be used for startup and operation expenses for new systems that are put into place. Uh, can also cover interest incurred during construction. Can be used for the purchase of existing facilities if it results in improved service or prevents the loss of service in a specific area. And it can be used for other costs that are determined to be necessary for the completion of the project. We take different types of security uh, for a loan depending on the type of applicant that we deal with. For municipalities, uh, municipalities will issue bonds that we will hold for the term of the loan. Those can be either revenue bonds or general obligation bonds or certificates of obligation. For nonprofit entities, we'll take a note in deed of trust for the term of the loan. Borrowers must also have the legal authority to construct, operate, and maintain the proposed services or facilities. All facilities receiving federal financing must be used for a public purpose, and the projects must be financially sustainable. For instance, if we go into a city that um, has a water and sewer system and we're only doing improvements to the sewer system, we have to ensure that the sewer system is sustainable by itself and they're, they're not relying on the water revenues to help sustain the sewer system. Um, how do you get started with an application? Well, we have um, offices throughout the state that serve every county. Uh, you can find us on the website and you can click on, there's a Texas County Service map to find your county and then you can access the employee directory for the office that services your area. Again, every county in the state, every county in the nation is covered. And although I didn't go into it in these slides, uh, we do also have financial assistance available to very low income homeowners in rural areas who are not tied to centralized sewer facilities. Through our Section 504 Single Family Housing Repair Loan and Grant Program, funds can be made available to improve or modernize a home, to make the home safer or more sanitary, or to remove health and safety hazards, such as to repair uh, failing septic systems that we were talking about today. For this program, the maximum loan is $20,000. It can be repaid over a maximum term of 20 years, and the interest rate is fixed at 1%. The grant funds are available to elderly homeowners age 62 or older who cannot afford to repay a loan, and then the maximum lifetime grant assistance available through that program is $7,500. So here's my contact information. I'm in the Hillsboro office. I actually serve uh, 26 counties, several of the counties that are um, in the COGS uh, area fall within my area as well. Um, so if you're within those counties, I would be your contact. If not, again, you can access our website and um, see who services your county and find out about the other programs that we administer uh, for rural communities. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Um, um, so now's the time. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to chat, uh, type them into the chat box and send them our way. Um, but just to kick it off, um, Anish, I had a question. You you mentioned AgriLife is working on inventorying and mapping um, OSSS throughout the state. Or have you done any work in the North Central Texas area? No, not really. Our work started in coastal zone. Uh, we got funding to do coastal zone inventory, so we are focusing on those counties right now. 
Um, so if we don't, we haven't received any questions, but if we do receive any or if you uh, have any that come to mind, please feel free to send them to me, Rachel Evans at the COG, and I'll make sure to um, get you the correct answer or you can contact the presenter directly. Um, here's everyone's contact information. And as always, you can find COG on all of the social media um, or on our website at nctcog.org slash envire. Um, thank you again for everyone who joined us today. The presentation and recordings will be made available on our website. Thank you again for your time, and this webinar is now over.